Bible says that from 2000 to 2000, from 2005 to 2006, uh, researchers from the Gallup poll asked about 125,000 people in 121 countries this question. Ask yourself how you respond to this question. The question was, did you feel a great deal of stress yesterday? Didn't ask about today. Did you feel a great deal of stress yesterday? Now, what percentage of the population of those people who were researched answered yes to that, that they felt stressed out? Well, worldwide, the average was 33%. And here in the United States, it was a little above that, about 43%. And at the time that this was done, 67% in the Philippines. And the reason probably for that in the Philippines was they, at that particular time, there was a, a, a major coup going on, and they had suffered several storm-related uh, disasters. Now, we have to believe the percentage of stress has gone up significantly since then, particularly after all that we've been through this past year. Many people are living with more stress than they have faced for years, if not their lifetime. When people are stressed and they're feeling anxious, one of the ways that comes out is anger. And of course, we've seen a lot of that going on. In her stress study, Dr. McGonagall, who's a health psychologist, asked this question. She said, if you had to sum up how you feel about stress, which of these two statements would be more accurate for you? One is, Stress is, is harmful and should be avoided, reduced, and managed. Is that on the slide, Bruce? Yeah, there it is. The second question is, stress is helpful and should be accepted, utilized, and embraced. Now, which do you believe is generally true? You know, which do you generally accept as true for yourself? We have been taught to view stress as mostly a negative kind of thing. It's harmful, it should be avoided, you know, do whatever you can to reduce it and minimize it. But stress and anxiety, the anxiety that comes with it, is actually on a, on a continuum. Not all stress, worry, or anxiety is bad in itself. It's not the stress alone that kills people. It's the combination of the stress and the belief that it's harmful to you. Now, contrary to what we usually believe about stress, there is an upside to it. It can actually be good for you. For one, stress gives you the energy to, to rise up to the challenge. We think of anxiety, you know, like I said, as a negative emotion that we, that we don't want to feel. It seems negative to us when we're feeling it. But it's actually energy preparing you to take on something that's difficult for you. It helps you get ready to face your challenges. It's like adrenaline waking up your senses, telling you and preparing you to take on something that's going to demand more from you. Stress also makes, makes you more social to encourage you to uh, connect with others. It motivates, motivates you to connect because you realize you need, you need strength and you need support. The problem is, since we tend to view stress negatively, we tend to do the opposite. We isolate it. We hunker down in our anxiety. We, we can get stuck in it, and it takes over. Dr. Edward Howell calls anxiety a heightened sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power. When we let anxiety take over, we feel helpless and we're vulnerable to all kinds of negative feelings. And instead of letting anxiety be the energy to take on our challenges, we avoid the stresses and we try to manage them on our own. And then stress also can help us learn and grow. When you look at the way your stressors can benefit your life and act on those beliefs, then you can learn, you can grow, you can become stronger, you become the person that you never imagined yourself being because you gained something meaningful from your experience. You're becoming a different person. 
And so Dr. McGonagall says, seeing the upside of stress is not about deciding whether stress is either all good or bad, it's about choosing to see the good in the stress and how it can help you meet your challenges in life. Stress is what you experience when something you care about is at stake. Rather than seeing stress as a sign that something is wrong in your life, it can be a way of measuring how engaged you are in activities that are, that are meaningful to you and tell you something about how much you value your relationships. I'm stressed out about this because this has happened to somebody, happening to somebody I care about. So when it comes to stress, the, cl the cliche really is true. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. How's that for some encouraging words this morning? It's not what we believe about stress that kills us. Or I should say it is what we believe about stress that, that kills us. And usually not just the stressful situation. When you believe life should be stress free, that's when you're in real trouble. If you were to subtract every day in your life in which you've experienced stress, we think we would find the ideal life. But what we would find is we've subtracted all the experiences that have helped us grow, the challenges that we've overcome, that have given us strength, and the depth of our relationships, what has given them value, and even what defines us as a person. When you start thinking of stress as a problem, well, then your thinking is the real problem. Avoiding what makes you anxious only reinforces your fears and leads to more worry. The truth is, most of us don't choose stress, the, the stress that we have in our lives. We can't always control what's stressful, whether it's situations or people or something else. But we have to learn to deal with stress if we want to become stronger and more joyful, rather than more anxious and powerless. In cases where anxiety affects your brain chemistry, you might have to take medication for that. But for most people, however, anxiety is not a brain problem. It's a heart problem. And in those situations, we often turn to something else besides God to deal with our stress. And so in Philippians chapter 4, Paul shows us how to have joy in our thoughts. To have joy in your mind, you have to deal with the anxiety in your heart. And so you need to proactively face the anxiety in your heart instead of avoiding it. Kelly McGonagall says, we need to develop a new mindset when we experience stress. A mindset that acknowledges that we're feeling stressed and to realize that anxiety is our response to something we care about. To make use of the energy that it gives us instead of wasting it on worry and trying to control it. So Paul reveals here in Philippians chapter 4 the stress relieving choices that helped him to live a joy filled life even in the middle of a very pressure packed ministry hounded by all kinds of difficulties. And so this is what he says in Philippians 4 verses 4 through 9. He says rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now notice the word always. Rejoice always, regardless of the situation. Paul's not saying that the situation might be joyful, but the joy is always found in the Lord, regardless of the situation. Anxiety will always try to rob you of your joy if you let it. 
But when you focus on Jesus himself, you can make some other choices. And that's what Paul is talking about here. First of all, you can choose to live without anxiety. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have anxiety. A better way to say it is you can, we can choose to live without living an anxious life. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Nothing that you and I face in life as a follower of Jesus Christ is worthy of worry. But you know, many times that doesn't stop us from it, does it? Dr. Walter Cavett did a study that found that only 8% of the things that we worry about is something that we're legitimately concerned about that might actually happen. The other 92%, and that's a whole lot, is imagined. Never happens. Is completely out of the realm of possibility of happening. Most of what we worry about just never takes place. And even if it does, we don't have to live an anxious life. When you strip anxiety and worry down to its core, it's really trying to control what we can't control. E. Stanley Jones says to live by worry is to live against reality because reality is defined by God's promises, not by our worries, not by what's going on around us or in our lives. Worry doesn't add a thing to, it, to life. It subtracts from the joy of living. Corey Ten Boom said, when I worry, maybe you should try this, when I worry, I go to the mirror and say to myself, this is a tremendous thing which has worried me. It's, it's beyond a solution. It's especially too hard for Jesus Christ to handle. And she says, after I say that, I smile. Because she realizes that's simply just not true. Now, can't I be concerned about something? Yes, you can. You know, you can see something that's very wrong in the present, and it concerns you. Worry is when we start looking ahead into the future and all the negative possibilities and problems. You have to make a distinction between uh, not putting your head in the sand about a current situation, while at the same time, not emotionally circling that with a lot of what ifs. You know, what if that happens? What if this takes place? Anxiety is an emotion that comes from worrisome thoughts. It's a future-focused emotion that's usually based on imagining worst-case scenarios. You're not only thinking in, in, in your mind, you're feeling it in your body, and it's affecting you emotionally. So what do you do instead of worry? Well, that's what Paul shows us here. So he goes on to say, here's what you do. Pray instead of panic. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in everything, by prayer and petition. If we prayed as much as we worried, we'd have a whole lot less to worry about. We're to pray about everything. If it's worth worrying about, it's more than worth praying about. Anxiety has to do with feelings of powerlessness. And what do you do with powerlessness? You go to the greatest power source there is, and that's God himself. But what we often do instead is we try to figure it all out. But prayer is, a, is the practical way God has given us for attacking and defeating worry. Worry is you trying to control a situation that's out of your control rather than entrusting it to God. An anxious life is really a life without prayer. A life of prayer is a life that is then filled with joy. That's because prayer is, is more than just about speaking to God about situations in our life. It's an attitude toward life. It's the attitude that I'm going to pray about it instead of worry about it. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are worried and troubled, and I will give you rest. You know, worship and worry, they cannot exist in our heart at the same time. When we're worshiping God, which prayer is a part of that, we're relying on his great power instead of what we can control ourselves. What or who you rely on when you're anxious makes all the difference in whether you live anxiously or joyously. When we rely on, on organization, A.C. Dixon says, we get what organization can do. 
When we rely upon education, well, we get what education can give us. When we rely upon eloquence, eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on prayer, we get what God can do. And so, Paul Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Now, we might think, since Peter was a fisherman, that casting was a fishing term. But it's actually used in Scripture in another place, and it means to transfer the weight. You know, the weight that you're carrying. You transfer it. We're to transfer the weight of our anxieties. We're to let God carry them. Our job is to transfer our anxieties. It's job, God's job to carry them. Kyle Lightman says that when his son was four, they were on a family road trip. They had driven all night to their location. And as they were unloading the truck, his little boy was hardly awake. And so Kyle handed him his bag and it nearly pulled him to the ground since it was so heavy and he was so small. He says as they were walking to the hotel, he stopped and he looked and he saw that his son couldn't seem to go any further. So Kyle says to him, he says, hey, hey, buddy, can I carry that for you? And his son nodded his head. And so Kyle took his bag and he started walking. And as he walked, noticed, he turned around, his son wasn't following. And that's because his boy was exhausted. You coming, buddy? He asked him. And his son said, Dad, will you carry me too? And so he says, I scooped him up in my arms, happy to carry his weight happy to carry him. I carried the weight of my son and his baggage. And I'll tell you, it was more of a joy than it was a task. God sees the weight of your baggage, the weight of your anxiety, and he asks you, why don't you let me carry it for you? Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And so what you believe about God makes all the difference in how you face down stress. If you're putting your faith in a God who gave up his own son for you, how can you not believe that he will graciously provide what you need in this anxious moment? Where you go with your stress tells you who you're walking with. So let me ask you, are you, are you walking with worry or are you walking with Christ? Are you carrying your anxiety or are you letting God care for you? And so Paul describes that. He goes on to describe how we should pray. He says, give gratitude to God. He says, don't worry about anything, but in your prayers, ask God for what you need. Always asking him with a thankful heart. We're not only to pray about everything that we're tempted to worry about, but it's how we pray that matters. Always, he says, pray with thanksgiving and not wringing hands. You know, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to manage? Those kinds of prayers, because that's really what they are, make you more anxious. Instead, we're always to give thanks. That doesn't mean we're thankful for the things that we're going through, but we're thankful for the God who's with us in the midst of what we're going through. And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18 reminds us, pray continually, give thanks, notice what it says, in all circumstances. Not for the circumstances, but in the circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So do you know what God's will for you is in a worrisome situation? His will for you is to pray, to come to Him, to trust Him, to cast yourself on Him, and as you do, to pray in the spirit of gratitude for who He is. I mean, this is the same one who came to give His Son for you. This is the same one who, Scripture says, graciously gives us all things. And so pray for who He is, what He's done in your life already and what he can and will choose to do in your situation. Paul is telling us to trust God's rule over our life. 
You know, none of us, our life is the way we wanted it to be. But God is working in it as it is. He's telling us that we'll never be content unless we make our heartfelt request and acknowledge that our lives are in, it, in His hands and that He's a whole lot wiser than we are. That is what we're doing when we thank Him for whatever He's going to do with our request. Robert Emmons, who's a deeply committed Christian and a leading authority on gratitude, says, Gratitude is one of the strongest links to mental health and satisfaction of life. Grateful people experience high levels of positive emotions, such as joy, enthusiasm, love, happiness, optimism. He says, gratitude protects us from destructive impulses of envy, resentment, greed, and bitterness. Researcher Sean Aker says, suggests that we train our brains to be more grateful by taking just five minutes a day to practice gratitude. He tells about a study where people were asked to write down three things, just three things they were thankful for each day. Three months later, the people who participated in the study were still more joyful and content. Even after six months, they were happier, less anxious, less depressed. Being grateful primes your heart to search for the good things in your life. Gratitude deepens as we see more and more of what we do have and not what we don't have. The joyful news of the abundant life of Christ is that the world's messages of you don't have enough are a lie. With gratitude, you see that you have God's flourishing life right here, right now, in front of you, and not just in some hoped-for situation. Then Paul says, here's another thing. You need to reorder your loves. He says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so we need to reorder our minds and our hearts. Watch, watch out what you allow to dwell in your mind. And be careful how it affects your emotions. It's not enough just to think the right things. It's also important to love the right things. So what are we to love? Well, Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Love such things. Let them captivate your mind and fill your heart. How you think and what you believe controls you and it affects your peace. Worry comes from the wrong kind of thinking and it stills your joy. Thanksgiving comes from the right kind of thinking and it gives you hope and strength and confidence. Not in yourself, but in God. To have peace of mind, you must control what you allow to dwell in your mind. You know, most people's minds are like an open freeway. Whatever comes in is just free to roam about and go wherever it wants. That's like not having virus protection on your computer. When you're not a thought discriminator, all kinds of infections can end up in your mind and heart. When you think you're immune to the world around you, that's when you're in the greatest danger of getting a virus. <laughs> that certainly makes a lot of sense this year, doesn't it? We watch violence on TV and invite all kinds of aggression into our thinking. We view illicit sex and then we have, find illicit desires roaming around inside us. We listen to vulgarity and before you know it, we have a vicious evil tongue coming out of our mouth. We constantly listen to the views of people who are skeptical and defame God and before you know it, we're dishonoring Him in some way. So if you think it doesn't matter what you think, you're already not thinking God's way. The scripture says we take captive every thought, every thought, to make it obedient to Christ. So what thoughts do you need to take captive that are leading you into an anxious life? When you take somebody captive, you literally confine them in a certain space. You put them where they're just not free to roam about. That doesn't mean that they're not there. But they're all round up. They cannot harm you. They can't get to you.
unless you let them take over your mind. You don't just resist or deny that you have anxious thoughts. Because like I said, you can't always choose what comes into your mind. But you can always choose where to focus your mind. You can take those anxious thoughts into captivity. You can confine them. You not only block anxious thoughts, you fill your mind with, with other kinds of thoughts. What thoughts? This is going to sound like a broken record, if you know what a record is. Of course, everybody in this room does. You fill your mind instead with what's admirable, hopeful, faith-building thoughts. Finally, brothers, what's true, what's noble, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely, what's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about such things. And so the thoughts that you and I allow to take up residence in our heart and mind, they will reap a harvest. So do you see what Paul's doing here? He's saying that if you are a Christian and you have little or no peace in your life, it could be because you're not thinking God's thoughts. You're allowing anxious, fearful thoughts to control your life. And if you make no effort to think God's thoughts after him, there's no way in the world that you're going to have peace. You know, you're not going to have his joy. You're not going to end up living the kind of life that he has meant for you in Christ Jesus. When you let God's mind control your mindset, that changes everything. A joyful person is not a person controlled by a set of certain, certain set of circumstances. It's a person who's controlled by a certain set of thoughts. What kind of thoughts? True thoughts. Right thoughts, noble thoughts, pure thoughts, lovely thoughts, admirable thoughts, excellent thoughts, praiseworthy thoughts. When you choose to think that way, do you know what that is? That's a picture of the way God thinks, the way God is. And so what Paul is saying is think about God, think like God, have the same mindset and affections as God. Again, Corey Ten Boom, you know, she spent some time in a Nazi concentration camp and lost several members of her family because they were hiding Jews in their home. Corey said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Isaiah says, you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You have the mindset of Jesus Christ. You can have the mindset of Jesus Christ even when facing anxious times and circumstances. And then Paul says one more thing. He says, practice God's presence in your life. He says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul was a living example of what he's talking about here. He completely trusted in God. He practiced God's presence. He put into practice the things that God said were true. So do you want more peace and less stress in your life, or at least a better way of handling stress? Then in, put into practice what God has already taught you. What he says is true, right, lovely, etc. Not what the world or your circumstances tell you. If you don't do what Paul says, which he actually did himself, then you're just going to be wringing your hands all the time. The truth is you haven't learned anything at all from God until you've learned to live with him and to activate his truth in your life. When we don't do what God has shown us is the right and good thing to do, that means we're going against the grain of his will. The Bible calls that sin. And sin always causes distress. But obedience, doing what God says, trusting him, following him, thinking like him, that gives us joy. When you make it a habit of applying the things that God has already taught you, you're going to have more peace. The opposite of worry is trust. When it comes to anxiety, we often trust our feelings more than we trust God. We need to turn that around. It doesn't mean that we deny our feelings. We acknowledge them, but we trust God rather than what our feelings are telling us. That's when we are putting into practice our faith. 
You know, I may not be seeing God, I may not be feeling Him right now, but I know that He's there, and I'm going to believe Him, I'm going to live for Him, I'm going to doubt my doubts, and I'm going to trust Him. So peace is not the absence of anxiety. Peace is the presence of God. Paul says that when you put into practice these things that God teaches you, the God of peace will be with you. When you trust Him and do what He says, you can count on Him being with you. The peace of God will not only guard your heart and your mind, but allows God Himself to guard your heart and mind. And so it's really a matter of taking your eyes off your circumstances and putting them on Him. Remember Peter, when he stepped out of the boat to walk on the water toward Jesus? The moment he took his eyes off Jesus, that's when he got anxious and he started to sink. That's the picture of what happens with our anxiety. The moment I start dwelling on what I can't control and worry about it constantly and try to figure it out and even fix it myself, that's when I forget that he is Emmanuel, God with us, guarding my heart and mind. That's when I start to feel anxious and get stressed out and begin to sing. When that begins to happen, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Trust and obey Him. Do what He says, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray together. God, in Your Word it says, that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Lord, we, we all have concerns, and sometimes we worry about things that are beyond our control, that are different from what we expected or hoped. We confess to you now the things that are heaviest upon our hearts here today, and that may even cause us to lose sleep. We know that you are not the source of fear and anxiety. Satan torments us with matters that are beyond our control because he wants us to take our eyes off of you, to lose our trust in you. May we remember that you are a good God, that everything you do for us and that plan for us is good and right and perfect and will fulfill your purposes for our lives. May we do like the scriptures say, we boldly say, the Lord is my help. I will not be afraid. You know, what can life do, us, do to us? Or people or circumstances? You are more powerful than any of these. Give us courage and strength to face what you already know is coming our way. As you said to Joshua, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so, Lord, we know you will never abandon us. You are with us no matter what we go through. The darkness wants to discourage us as we go through the uncertainties of today's life or the attacks of the enemy. But you are with us. You walk with us, even when life takes us through the fire. So teach us to throw our anxieties today where they belong, into your loving arms. We cast all of our anxieties on you because we know that you care for us. We transfer the weight of them to you. We'll let you carry them. We'll let you carry us, because we believe that you will always sustain us with your love. Our confidence in you will not be shaken. Our confidence in your goodness, it will not be shaken. Our confidence in your perfect plans for us, that will not shake us either. Our confidence in your ever-abiding presence with us gives us strength. We put ourselves underneath your everlasting arms. And Lord, we will not give in to our distresses. No, we will rest on you, the rock of our foundation, the hope of our every breath. Upon you, we will live one day at a time and we'll trust you for the very next moment. So give us thankful hearts today. 
Give us hopeful hearts. Give us trusting hearts. Give us courage to face our fears. But most of all, give us yourself, your peace, your joy. May it rule our hearts because you promised us you would keep us in perfect peace as we fix our lives and our thoughts upon you. We will not live 